Good morning, my name is Greg Fisher. I'm the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And today I'd like to talk about smart monitoring, the future of predictive algorithms, algorithms with special emphasis on cerebral autoregulation. The only conflict of interest that I have to declare is that I am in the Speaker's Bureau of Edwards Life Sciences. So the objectives of today's talk, why is arterial hypotension bad? Is it even bad? Explain the function of modern cerebral oximeters and how they can help map cerebral autoregulation. And then finally, how might this play a role in future care of our patients? So first, a little bit of background. Is intraoperative arterial hypotension even bad? And when does arterial hypotension start? This has been debated for decades among anesthesiologists, and you're going to find a very different uh, spectrum of answers as to where arterial hypotension starts and how long should it persist and if it's even bad. Terry Monk um, has given us some literature on this topic, and she published in Anesthesiology in 2015 very nice paper showing associations between intraoperative hypotension as well as hypertension and 30-day postoperative mortality in non-cardiac surgical patients. This is an overview table here looking at hypotension. And as you can see here, patients who are uh, hypotensive with systolic blood pressures under 70 for more than five minutes, they had an almost threefold increase of 30-day mortality. This was also held true for low MAP values. You can see MAP under 40 for more than five minutes has almost a 21 uh, times increase in 30-day mortality, as well as uh, low diastolic blood pressures. So there's certainly not a good thing for patients to have. Daniel Sessler and his group also did a sub-analysis of the POISE-2 trial and was able to show that in non-cardiac surgical patients that there is an association uh, between 10-minute increase intervals in hypotension and a composite outcome of, 30, of uh, myocardial infarction and 30-day mortality. In further analysis of uh, this data, which was published in the British Journal of Anesthesiology, earlier this year, they were able to model where this would happen. And you can see here, if they use a time-weighted um, time uh, um, analysis of MAP as well as minimum MAP, that probably somewhere around 70 millimeters of mercury, there seems to be a knee here, an inflection point where the risk of 30-day mortality increases. Similar data has been able to be shown with both myocardial infarction rates, rates as well as renal insufficiency rates in the post-operative period. This data has led me at Memorial Sloan Kettering to increase our MAP thresholds from 55 millimeters of mercury to 65 millimeters of mercury as sort of a goal where we try to keep our patients at. Now, the problem of looking at all of this data that I just presented to you is we're not looking at an individual patient. There is no doubt that low blood pressure is bad. However, we're not all the same. And the data that I just showed you is population-based data. So you're gonna have a median and you're gonna have a standard deviation. You're gonna have a spread around that medium. And spreads, as with most biological functions, do tend to be quite large. And that's something that we always have to keep in mind is that we're actually not taking care of a population, but we take care of the individual patient. And I believe most practitioners can understand this when I give just two case scenarios here. You know, one day you're coming and you're taking care of a 20 year old, otherwise completely healthy male patient for a hernia repair, who you classify as an ASA1. And the next day you come in and you take care of an 87 year old male with a, a whole slew of comorbidities and um, you're classifying that patient as an ASA for hemodynamic management and your, your concern of hypotension will be very different in these two scenarios. So as Mark Twain said, all generalizations are false, including this one. So the question now becomes, how can we get away from population health and how can we start identifying the lower limit or how low one can go with blood pressure in the individual patient that we are taking care of right now? One of the monitoring modalities that I'd like to talk about, which might potentially help us here, is cerebral oximetry. Cerebral oximetry has been on the market, has been available for decades. Um, 
Its primary use today is found in the realm of cardiac anesthesia. It is not pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry, most clinicians are very comfortable with. It's a standard of care. Pulse oximetry shows you the saturation of the arterial blood. Those of us that um, practice critical care are very comfortable with the mixed venous, which would be venous saturation. Cerebral oximetry finds itself somewhere in between. It's about 30% arterial, 70%. Venus, it's sort of like a capillary, a microcirculatory saturation, and its normal values are 60 to 80%. I'm just going to give a brief background of the physiology behind cerebral oximetry. The uh, first thing that we have to understand is the hemoglobin molecule that is the carrier of oxygen. The hemoglobin molecule is very interesting. Uh, it can carry up to four molecules of oxygen, and as soon as it associates with one oxygen molecule, a three-dimensional configurational change occurs to the molecule, changing its spectroscopic fingerprint. What does that mean? It means, as a chromophore, it can absorb electromagnetic energy in the visual spectrum. It changes the wavelength of light that it can absorb. Hence, we see a change in the color. We all know that from our practice that arterialized blood, uh, oxygenated blood, arterial blood is very bright red, whereas venous blood has the tendency to be darker. The wavelengths that are chosen are interesting as well um, because they can actually transcend through tissue, even through bones. So the wavelengths that are chosen by which we can, uh, we can um, use to, to uh, assess the concentrations of oxygenating and deoxygenated hemoglobin are those that can also transfer through the bone. And that's the way, or that's the, the, the that what gives us the ability to measure the cerebral cortex. Here again is a picture of the spectroscopic window that we have here at somewhere between 660 and 900 nanometers. And you can see here nicely that the spectroscopic fingerprints between oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin are different. And also lucky for us, in that range, there are not a lot of other molecules, not a lot of other chromophores that can interfere with the light, with the electromagnetic energy or photons that we send into the patient. The function of oximetry is based on bare Lambert's law. If we know the intensity of the electromagnetic energy that we shine into a medium, and we can measure the intensity once it goes through the medium, there's obviously going to be a change because some of this energy was absorbed by the chromophore. And if we know the path length, then we can calculate what the concentration of that chromophore is. So the clinical utility of cerebral oximetry prior to 2007, it was used mainly to detect catastrophic events, you know, cannulas that were placed in the, in the wrong position, forgetting to put the lungs off after one comes off uh, bypass. All of these things have been described and were being able to be picked up very rapidly with cerebral oximetry. After 2007, clinicians became more uh, aggressive and they thought that they could use the technology to predict outcomes in patients. And if they would optimize patients based on cerebral oximetry, that they could actually even improve outcomes. And the reason why I use 2007 is that's when this landmark paper from Mark, uh, John Merkin's group was published. This was a paper where 100 patients undergoing an elective coronary artery bypass grafting procedure were randomized to two groups, 100 in each group. Both groups received cerebral oximetry monitoring. One group was monitored and the value was optimized to stay within 25% of the uh, baseline value. The other group, the value was masked and the clinicians just performed standard of care. And you can see here the um, adverse events that happened. And when these events were all pooled into one group, in other words, a cohort outcome, you can see that the overall incidence was much lower in the uh, intervention group than it was in the control group. Now, this is monitoring cardiac surgical patients, but let's get to the meat of the talk. How can we use cerebral oximetry to help us with cerebral autoregulation? This curve should be known for most of us from medical school. It basically says that between a certain blood pressure range that the perfusion, uh, the blood flow through the brain should be consistent and it should be pressure independent. Once we surpass the upper and the lower inflection points down here or up here, then the, uh, the, the 
uh, organ perfusion to cerebral perfusion becomes pressure dependent. So let's talk about that lower limit of autoregulation. Much has been published over this. A paper back in the 1950s said that the lower limit would probably be safe to have people go as low as 45, 50 millimeters of mercury before ischemic brain damage occurs. More recent work has shown that these values are probably much higher and the sicker populations, the more sick populations that were looked at, the higher the uh, lower inflection limits were to be found. And what you can see with all of these investigators though is there is a fairly wide range. So again, these median values that you're seeing here are population health. Even within the population, there is quite a range. How did I get interested? in cerebral oximetry and possibly being able to use it to detect the lower autoregulation limit in my patients. When I was doing work about 15 years ago on uh, patients undergoing general anesthesia in the beach chair position for soldier surgery, I noticed that when patients' blood pressures declined and I would treat with phenylephrine, that every time when the blood pressure went back up, I saw these spikes here in the cerebral oxygenation, which of course led me to believe that there is some association or correlation even between the blood pressure and the SCTO2 um, value. So I'm not the only one who thought this, there is other groups that have been working on this as well. Uh, this is uh, Chuck Hoke's group, uh, they were looking at cardiac surgical patients who were on bypass, and they were using a similar, uh, they, they had a similar observation that when patients' blood pressure was low on bypass, that they would see the SCO2 value decrease. When they brought the blood pressure back up, it would come up again. And they used that technique to identify where that lower inflection point was. And this is a cohort of patients you can see here how interesting it is and how wide the spread actually is. So it is true that some patients actually do have their lower inflection point at 50, but a large majority are actually higher than that. Some even as high as 80, 85, or even 90 millimeters of mercury. So how can we use the cerebral tissue oxygen saturation number to help us understand what cerebral blood flow is? Well, the SCTO2 is a product between cerebral blood flow, hemoglobin concentration, and PaO2. Now, if we measure this cerebral tissue oxygen saturation with high temporal resolution, so let's say twice in a second, two hertz, then we shouldn't really have any change in hemoglobin or in PaO2 when we use such a high temporal resolution rate. So really what SCO2 is reflecting now is changes in cerebral blood flow. And that's really the concept of how it works, all right? So we have this autoregulation index, and that's the correlation between the mean arterial blood pressure and cerebral oxygenation, in other words, SCTO2. So under normal situations, if you are within your autoregulation range, then there should not be a change in SCO2 when blood pressure changes. So they should be decoupled from each other. There should be a very low autoregulation index, less than 0.3 or 0.4. Here's the, again the graph to help understand that a little bit. So if you're finding yourself in this range here, then there should be no correlation between cerebral tissue oxygenation and blood pressure. However, once you start going under this lower inflection point, then you're going to see the autoregulation increase, or once you go above the upper inflection point, then you'll see the autoregulation in, um, index increase. So I'm going to show you some work that we've done at Memorial Sloan Kettering. This is a typical profile. We've looked at 29 um, cases so far. And what you can see here quite nicely is this typical profile of a patient that the autoregulation index is quite low in this middle range here between 70 and 110 millimeters of mercury map. And once you go either beneath or above this range, then you get to that lower inflection or the upper inflection point. And here is where uh, the autoregulation index starts to spike upwards towards one. In other words, the cerebral tissue oxygen saturation and blood pressure all of a sudden start to correlate. So you would want to manage this patient somewhere in this sweet spot here in this range here between 70 and 110 millimeters of mercury. Now we've seen some patients where we were not able to identify a lower inflection point, 
but we were able to identify an upper inflection point, and we had some patients where we were able to identify a lower inflection point, but not an upper inflection point. Now, I believe that that doesn't mean that these patients don't have a lower upper inflection point. We just never monitored, or we just never had that hemodynamic picture during the case. So what is the conclusion to my talk? If you knew the inflection points of the autoregulation curves, and if you could predict which patients would become hypotensive, then you could tailor your hemodynamic management to the individual patient's needs. So with that, I thank you all very much.